So we welcome you folks to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, and for inform your community, what we're here to do is integrate fun uh, with fun events with interesting topics, uh, interesting and important topics. And that's what we're here to talk about with you today is um, the, the topic of food waste. So we're, we're so grateful to, to have our wonderful guest here today, which you'll get to hear a lot from. Uh, and we want you to uh, make sure that you check us out on our social media, which you can find our social media links on the bottom of our webpage, but also you can sign up for our email list. Uh, I'm sorry, and ask your friends to sign up more, even more so, because if you registered for the event today, you're already on our mailing list, but ask your friends to sign up for our mailing list as well, so they can hear about our wonderful events in the future. This topic of food waste is a topic that really has in, in, impressed me a lot and how much people have been interested in this topic. And uh, particularly, I have to say, it didn't matter if somebody had uh, hazel eyes or brown eyes, if they were tall or short, uh, if they wore glasses or didn't wear glasses. Once I told them we were having an event about food waste, they were very excited about it. They wanted to come. Um, but I have to tell you truthfully that the reason we're doing this event today is really just because of me. I, I have a question and, and I need it answered and I'm hoping this event will answer this question. And that question is when I have that last bite of food that I can't possibly eat because I'm just so stuffed, should I eat it? So that's the question I'm dying to know. I need this event to help me with this dilemma. And so I'm hoping Jenny will help us with that, with that question. So we're here today because of that, because I want this question answered, but also because to tell you the truth, I really like Real, Weird Al Yankovic. And this title of this movie is great, Just, Just Eat It is a great title for a movie. Uh, and so between those two things that helped us get here where we are right now. And so this documentary has won 14 awards, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, sadly, we're actually not watching the movie here today, but the good news is that we will be airing this movie on May 12th. So we encourage everyone to come back um, May 12th. We'll, we'll, if you've registered for this event, we're gonna of course send you that information. You can find it on our, our website as well. Uh, and we'll be posting it soon. Uh, and also of course, if you sign up for our social media, you'll get that information um, if you follow us. So we will host the movie uh, in a future event on May 12th. And in the meantime, if you absolutely cannot wait to watch the movie till then, which I understand, then you're going to be able to find that movie on Amazon Prime and Netflix. And we encourage you not only to watch it with us on May 12th, but also to, uh, to watch it in advance. Uh, so watch it twice because it is just that good. So go on to Amazon uh, Prime or Netflix and, and watch that movie. But since we not all of us have seen it, I want to give you a brief synopsis. And you'll forgive me if I read a little bit while I tell you about it. Um, so filmmakers and food lovers Jen and Grant dive into the issue of food waste from farm through retail all the way to the refrigerator. And after catching a glimpse of billions of dollars of good food that's just tossed away each year in North America, they pledged to quit grocery shopping, cold turkey, and survive only on foods that would otherwise be thrown away. In a nation where one in 10 people is food insecure, the images they capture in this movie of squandered groceries are both shocking and strangely compelling. But as Grant's addictive personality turns full tilt towards food rescue, the thrill of the find has unexpected consequences that you'll see when you watch the movie. Just eat it looks at our systemic obsession with its fiery baits, perfect produce and portion sizes, and reveals the core of the seemingly insignificant issue that is actually having a devastating consequence around the globe. Just Eat It brings farmers, retailers, inspiring organizations and consumers to the table in a cinematic story that is equal parts education and delicious entertainment. So we encourage you to watch that, but for now we have our speaker series event uh, and we're, we're so excited here in our speaker event, we always have a subject matter expert who's talking to us about a topic uh, and that, that's important um, and also gives us the opportunity to have questions and answers from our audience. So throughout the event, we encourage you to put your questions in the chat and either uh, me or, or Robbie, who will introduce in a few minutes, will um, make sure we get as many questions as possible answered. Um, and also um, at the end, if we have time, we'll ask some more questions as well, but we will try to answer them interspersed with our own questions as we go along throughout the event. So to help us uh, understand this topic of food waste better and to tell us about her experience, we have Jenny Rustemeyer that is joining us today. 
And Jenny is a documentary producer based in Vancouver, Canada, who works primarily alongside her partner, uh, uh, Grant Baldwin, who was her co-star in this film. A flexible and creative filmmaker, Jenny wears many hats on her productions and is truly invested in them from beginning all the way to the end of that process. Over the last decade, her films have garnered high praise, as I mentioned, the, the uh, 14 awards uh, for Just Eat It, A Food Waste Story, but um, also she's really won awards from around the globe and her film has been, films have been translated into multiple languages. So, so glad that she can be here with us. Um, she also had a broadcast primetime um, show on MSNBC and was listed in the New York Times as a top 10 TV show of 2015. So Jenny is the writer producer of the Clean Bin Project, This Mountain Life, and most recently, Search and Rescue North Shore. We're absolutely honored to, to have Jenny with us today. To help us navigate this discussion, uh, we have Robbie Copley, uh, who's going to help us with the question uh, and answer portion of our event. And Robbie, uh, he's gonna serve as our interrogator, I mean, um, facilitator, facilitator for the event. And he studied environmental studies, uh, environmental science, and sorry, environmental science and policy. And he's worked on climate and human rights campaigns. Um, he also personally tries to live a sustainable life and is a passionate and advocate, a passionate advocate and nonprofit practitioner. So we, we welcome Robbie as well. So Robbie, go ahead and um, take us away. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks all for coming. I'm just going to um, spotlight myself. If you don't, oh, thank you. And I'm gonna spotlight Jenny. Okay. Jenny, thank you so much for being here. Um, some of us have seen the film, some of us haven't seen it yet, but um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to just introduce yourself, maybe give us a little background. I'm particularly curious about how you came to this project, Just Eat It. Like what, what was your experience leading up to it? Yeah, so we were just regular citizens. I mean, I'm a professional filmmaker now, but um, at the time that we came up with this project, we weren't. My partner Grant and I had made one previous film and it was about recycling. So we were really into like reducing our waste and um, looking at what people threw out. And we were actually doing a presentation at a, at a school and we were looking in their garbage. We were doing a waste audit. So like separating you know, the paper and the other recyclables, trying to see where they actually should have put things. And we noticed that there was a lot of food in the garbage, like there were pudding cups and bananas and granola bars, like things that were not touched. Um, and that was the first time that I kind of realized that edible food was ending up in the garbage. And we thought, oh, if it's happening at the school, like where else is it happening? So when we went home, we started like Googling and doing a little bit of research, ordered a couple books on the topic. And this was back in, I want to say, 2012. Um, and just like the next day, we knew like this is going to be the topic for our next film. Um, our previous film, we'd also filmed ourselves because you have unlimited access when you're filming yourself. Um, so we followed that same model and we wanted to make it fun. So we like to set parameters where you're having yourself a challenge over a specific amount of time, be it, you know, three months, six months, a year. So this was six months living exclusively off rescued food. And that was the framework for the film. And then throughout that journey, we were able to meet experts and farmers and wholesalers and people that work in the food system. So we learned so much. Like I didn't know anything about the food system before we started this project. Interesting. So you, you were a filmmaker first mm, um, because you know, the actually, filmmaker, the film was so well-made. We had made one previous documentary, but I had a day job. Like this was a hobby film that we made in our spare time. Wow. Um, and, you know, on the evenings and weekends, and I'd take vacation from my job so we could go down to California and visit the farms and things like that. However, after the film launched, um, it was released at Hot Docs, which is the largest film fest in, in North America for documentary. Um, and also at, at IDFA in, in Europe, which is the biggest documentary film fest in the world. And after that, we got quite busy. So then I did end up quitting my job and, and just touring with the film and talking about food waste quite a bit. Cool. Um, so for people who are new to this topic of food waste, what do you think are like a top level 
kind of some facts or figures that we need to know? Sure. Well, I mean, food waste is rampant. There is about globally about one third of food gets wasted. Um, and at a consumer level, it could even be higher. Um, it's also something that as consumers, I think when you're concerned about environmental issues, some of them seem very kind of nebulous, like how do you really measure your carbon impact? But when we're talking about food waste, you can really measure it. You can see how much you're wasting and there's a real dollar value associated with it. And the other part of it is that consumers are responsible for most of the food that's being wasted. So even though in our film, you see dumpsters full of say hummus or other products from the wholesale level, it's actually us as consumers in our houses that are having the most impact, which is, I mean, it's sad, but it's also heartening because it means that we can do a lot as individuals on this particular topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my building in New York City used to have a, a building-wide compost program. Mm -hmm. So right in the basement, I would take food down every day or two days and dump all my food scraps. And I felt really good about that. I, even though I didn't feel good about having the food scraps, you know, but they, mm -hmm. they accumulate anyway, banana peels and whatnot. Um, but then the pandemic started and they stopped the program. Like the city kind of paused it. Um, That's interesting. And we're all just waiting for this to come back online. Um, so it's a little frustrating, but you know, there's farmer's markets. You just have to go out of your way to like package it and bring your, your scraps to the market. Um, okay. Well, like another thing on an individual level is like how many people really know like how they're, for instance, like the crisper in the fridge. I, when I was thinking, when I watched the film and I was thinking about it, I'm like, I don't really know what the little dial thing, like, <laughs> what do I set it to, to save the pepper or whatever? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm not the best expert on this. Um, <laughs> and certainly one of the experts in our film, Dana Gunders, ended up after the film, she wrote a book um, of all about like reducing food waste in your household. And it does have lots of tips. So like, for example, I know that apples emit a gas that ripens other fruits and vegetables too fast. So it's right. best to keep them in the plastic bag in the crisper so they're not kind of like contaminating your other produce. Um, and I know that apples and potatoes like to be kept out of the fridge in a cool, dark place. So I think, yeah, there's a lot to be learned about the way that we store things to make them last longer. Some herbs like to be in a glass of water upright and some herbs like to be, uh, you know, wrapped in a, in a moist cloth um, and that makes them last longer in your fridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I recently learned that I think, is it avocados or bananas? Like they don't wanna be next to each other. Oh, interesting. Well, everything ripens faster if there's a banana near there. Yeah, and like, you know, the onions and the potatoes, like they don't wanna be, they don't wanna hang out together. So it's just like, it's a lot to think about. Um, you know, and there is a lot that's kind of put on the consumer to kind of figure this stuff out. Um, but there's also the systemic problems, like the bigger, you know, the wholesalers and the retailers and the farms and um, the market forces, um, which is which is complex. And I'm wondering, like, how how can we as consumers address those bigger systemic problems? I mean, I kind of like to think of it as two, two problems. Like the first problem is we have a logistics problem so that we actually have quite a bit of hunger in North America, you know, not everybody has enough food to eat. And so the logistics of getting the food to people who need the food is a big one. And that's why I think nonprofits have a really big role to play as well, because they are getting a lot of surplus food. Let's not call it food waste because it really is just good food that's extra food. Um, into the hands of people who could really use that food. So there's a logistical problem. And then there is a production problem. Like we produce way more food than we actually need to eat on the world market. Um, and I think that's a tougher one um, in terms, of, because in the film we highlight like a, an orchard and they're not gonna take down trees. And some years they have a boom year and some years they have a smaller year. So they can't control it as much. But certainly, you know, if you're if you're growing celery or carrots or something like that, you could be looking at how much you need to really plant to make sure that you're um, getting it to your markets, but like not over planting. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the way that our farm system works is that it generally is cheaper to like plant more and then plow it under if it's not going to sell. 
And we saw many, many fields uh, that were getting plowed under that had perfectly good food in them just because they had some kind of aesthetic problem with them or they, we went to a, a melon farm. This is not in the film, but went to a melon farm and they tested some of the melons. They said they weren't sweet enough. Like there's some kind of sweetness factor. And so then they were like, no, they don't meet our criteria. We're not gonna sell them at all. And they just plowed it all under. Oh. Um, and like, I wonder if these bigger logistical problems are, are these, are these on policymakers radar? Like do, you know, there's so much in the news, there's so much like chaos constantly in the news and in government, but do, do they know that this is a huge problem that needs to be addressed on a systemic basis as well as an individual basis? Like in general, I think no. Um, of course, there's always individuals and that's really all it takes often. Uh, Tristan Stewart, who is another expert from our film, he lives in the UK and he has a, a foundation that does multiple, multiple um, food rescue type projects. And, and he got legislation changed in, in Europe where they're bringing bananas in and they're like specifying how curved they have to be. Um, and things were getting rejected because they weren't the exact perfect banana shape, which is ridiculous. Like we all know they're all the same on the inside. Um, and so he did get the legislation changed. And he's worked directly with growers as well. So they had a case where they had these long beans and they were cutting like quite a bit of them off to fit them in the bag. And so they were able to kind of rejig that manufacturing process so that they had a longer bag and then they would fit them in. And it seems like obvious, but really it takes someone who's really passionate to like go in and help them make that systemic change because everybody is so busy. You know, farmers mm -hmm. are busy, they want to do the right thing, but they don't have lots of extra time to be exploring options. So, you know, yeah. it does come down to passionate individuals that want to make a difference. Cool. Um, I just want to invite everybody to um, share your questions if you have them in the chat, and I will, um, I will come to them. Um, can you walk us through, um, again, like on the high level, the supply chain? Because I, I was a little confused about what is a wholesaler in the in the grocery context. Yeah, so I mean, things are grown on the farm and then sometimes they need to be manufactured. So things like celery and iceberg lettuce, they're often packaged like right on the farm, like right off the truck, they have the bags right there and they're just popping them in the bags and then they put them in the boxes right on the farm and they go straight to a wholesaler, which is like a big warehouse that redistributes food basically. Um, and they might have many, many different brands. And then of course, some things are manufactured like crackers and cereal, they need another level of processing, but most things do go through a wholesaler and they sell to the grocery stores. So there's like quite a few steps in between. And by the time you get your food, it's probably traveled quite, quite a ways. Um, mm -hmm. I know for us up here in Vancouver, we get a lot of our food from California and most of the states gets their food from California because they can grow year round. Um, and so it's just about the logistics and that includes like refrigerated trucks and freezers and so much gasoline to get things from one place to the next um, and the refrigeration all the way through. And the, the sorting process, it happens at wholesalers as well as? It happens, yeah, things could get culled anywhere along the line. So at the farm, they're definitely sorting things, trying to grade them into different sizes and shapes. Um, and then things that will go to market. I know uh, the major uh, market here in Canada is in Toronto. And so we went there and they, all of the wholesalers come and the smaller buyers buy from them. So the large buyers will have already put in their order. And then they kind of take the second tier vegetables out to there. And then, and you get all the way down to the mom and pop shops that literally like go to the market and select what they're buying. So that's why I've noticed like sometimes you can get like kind of second grade things and they're a little bit cheaper at those smaller grocery stores. But I consider that kind of saving food because if you didn't buy them, then like the next step for them is to go in the trash. Mm. Okay, um, interesting. So I've got a question in the chat. Um, We'd love to know how much was left on the cutting room floor. Like when you spoke about the melon farm, like I'm sure yeah. that there was a lot that went on. Um, watching you get grumpy when you were hungry, I was like so relating <laughs> to that and wanting to see more of the like struggle because yeah. I felt it. 
there were I mean we were pretty intentional with what we filmed but there were lots of farm stories that we couldn't show so um, I think we illustrated the point of farm surplus with celery and with peaches and but we went to many other farms while we were down there and actually kudos to those farmers because they didn't have to let us in and show us their operations they were kind of opening themselves up to be ridiculed a little bit um, and what we had actually been hoping to film with them was that we heard that the um, that there was a nonprofit that was working with them to add extra boxes right onto their trucks so that when they had surplus they could just like when they were cutting the celery they were supposed to put the extra ones into that box and then the nonprofit was paying for that little bit of extra labor that it took to do that and in exchange they got to take that celery but unfortunately that wasn't happening the day that we were there so we didn't get to capture it um something that we that we filmed that we didn't put in the film was uh cauliflower that a field of cauliflower huge heads of cauliflower like so big that he said they're actually too big like they're too big for market and they were they're plowing them under so yeah heartbreaking but we just felt like we couldn't like pound people over the head with like the same message over and over so not everything made it in in the film oh so um yeah i, I would be curious to you know if you if you would think about putting together like um a reel of like bonus footage or what is it or, there is bonus footage i think if you go to foodwastemovie.com um i think we have some special features on oh, there. I okay. should, definitely it's on the dvd but i'm not sure if it's on the website or not i should know that um me too actually um thank you though i, I will check it um so what are a couple of the main solutions shared in the film to avoid food waste as a consumer sure i mean we save the solutions to the very very end the, the film is kind of designed as like an introduction to the concept of food waste. So it's like a broad overview. And then at the very end, we're like, here's some, a few things you can do. And I know that there are other films that have come out more recently that are like more solutions based, um, but just generally as consumers, um, the biggest thing you can do is to plan ahead. So um, like to meal plan, to buy only the food that you need. So basically take only what you can eat and eat everything that you take and it, it's super simple um but it's surprising how many people don't do it so i'm all about eating leftovers i'm not the greatest meal planner COVID actually helped me with that because when they really lock down and they're like don't go grocery shopping for two weeks kind of thing then i would literally plan meals for two weeks do one big grocery shop and then stay at home. Yeah. And, and that really helped us with our food waste because we weren't going anywhere. We weren't dining out very much. And you know, we had this routine where we were really eating everything that we brought into the house. So yeah, it helped us for quite a while. Yeah, I think I've made some progress as well, um, but I still feel like I'm not doing enough. Um, like when I'm at the grocery store, should I be looking for things that are like near the expiry date? Like, is that, I, I saw you do that in the film and I'm like, yeah. hmm, I'm always doing the opposite. And I guess that's not right. I kind of do. I mean, with milk, I have no problem buying stuff that is, especially if they mark it down, that's a bonus. Um, but I have no problem with buying stuff that is close dated because I know that our family goes through milk really quickly and I'm definitely going to drink it, you know, within a few days. Um, if you're the kind of person that takes a really long time to, to drink your milk, then fine, get something that is as long dated as you can get. Um, but even then, like we have to remember those dates are just, you know, they're recommendations. It's just the best before date. It doesn't mean that it's bad after that date. And I, I eat food past the date all the time. It's just mm -hmm. a recommendation. There's no specific legislation about what date you have to put on there. Um, Ksenia says that um, they recommend using services like Imperfect Foods, mm -hmm. um, and there's another one like Misfits Market, mm -hmm. um, where you can sign up and get box deliveries. I think that's what Imperfect Foods is too, where you get box delivery of um, the ugly peach and the funky looking banana that's not the perfect curve. Mm -hmm. um, so those are really good services that probably more people should sign up for because they're super discounted. It's food that would be going to the dumpster. Um, and now it's nutrition in your home and you don't have to spend as much money for it. Um, and those, some of those delivery companies too, I mean, they're cutting out that last part of the, 
the food system, which is the grocery store. So it's like a little bit less transportation and actually quite a bit less waste because they're not like putting it all out on their shelves. Some of it perishes and then they pack it up. They've already got it in the warehouse and they're packing directly into the boxes. I know, I know Imperfect in particular um, because the men who started Imperfect met at a conference where we were showing our film and everybody was talking about food waste and it was um, someone who knew all about farm systems and logistics who had helped connect us with the farmers in our film and um, somebody who started the Food Recovery Network, which is a network of university campus programs where they um, rescue food from cafeterias on campus and, and container it up and then take it to places that need it. And it is all across the states. They do amazing work. And so that was his first uh, nonprofit startup. And then he moved on to start Imperfect. So yeah, we've been following their progress. I'm pretty impressed. Um, and one last like kind of logistic-y question is, when when do you feel like this problem really started or like when did it become this bad um at some i mean it feels like we didn't i mean it was like the 1940s that we got refrigerators right which is it's kind of relatively recent so when did all of this kind of logistical nightmare begin or did it just kind of gradually spin out of control so what I've read is that after World War II is when we really started to kind of have a surplus. We had a surplus of, of chemicals that could be used as fertilizer. And we also had um, a surplus of wealth. So, you know, we'd figured out that um, we had refrigeration, our lives were getting technically easier and food became more and more abundant and cheaper. And then um, people were spending less on it. And so then you kind of value it less. And that's kind of when our culture really started to shift to like always having your fridge totally full um, and abundant just in case someone drops by. Um, and I mean, I like to do that too. I, you know, it's nice to be able to feed people when they come. Um, and certainly, you know, I'd go over to my grandma's and she would always have her freezer full of cookies and things like that. But it's also when everybody is doing it and over purchasing, then it leads to systemic change. So yeah, I mean, it's, in some ways, it hasn't been that long. It's only been a couple generations. So we can definitely kind of turn back the clock if we want to. Um, but it's really ingrained in our society now. Yeah. Um, did you encounter any stereotypes while making the film? Like from people that you know or didn't know? Like when you're in the supermarket asking about the expiry dates and what were some of the stereotypes? and? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing, right? Like it's, it's embarrassing to buy things off the discount shelf because people think you don't have enough money to buy the other food. Um, it's super embarrassing to dumpster dive. I did not tell my colleagues that we were doing that, even though I was doing it for like an academic project. I still found it um, very stigmatizing. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate because people are trying to save money or save food for all kinds of reasons. And it really shouldn't reflect poorly on the person. Um, and that's why also I try to always say surplus food instead of food waste, because food waste is kind of like garbage. And I, I remember one of the nonprofits that we worked with, they were like, what are you doing this film on? And we're like, oh, we're doing a food waste. And they're like, we don't want anything to do with that. Even though they were redistributing surplus food to people who need it, um, they just did not want to be associated with waste, garbage, anything like that. They're like, this is mm -hmm. like, they were all about feeding people with dignity and it is not about garbage. So that's interesting. Cause yeah. once you call it waste, there's just an image in your mind of garbage, which is not, which is not what it is. That imperfect banana doesn't have to be garbage. Exactly. And actually the vast majority of food that we were finding was perfectly packaged. Like there was nothing wrong with it. An example would be um, a pallet of jam. So they're all in glass jars and the pallet falls over and some of them break. Well, like they don't have the time to go through and pick which jars are okay. So they throw the whole thing out. And of course the rest of the jars of jam are totally perfectly fine. When we got it home, you could tell no difference between our product and a product that you would have bought at the store for $6. So, you know, most of the food we were finding was like that type of condition. And would you say, like, what, what was the most outlandish thing that you saw? Oh, 
I guess there's two. Once we found a whole dumpster full of hummus, and that was the first time that I saw an entire dumpster full of, of one type of food, which is, it's truly, truly shocking. Like we found dumpsters all the time full of like a mix of things, but when it's just one, you're just like the scale of it is incredible. Um, and then the second one that we found was chocolate. Um, there's like boxes and boxes of chocolate, like hundreds of bars of chocolate, um, really delicious organic. Um, and the problem with that was that here in Canada, you have to have both French and English on the package. And those ones had come with just English labels. Um, so I, I had talked to that warehouse before and they had repackaged some of them, but it's quite a bit of labor to like open the cardboard box, open the small box inside, take out the thing, put the sticker on. Um, and so they only did it for some of them and the rest of them they chucked. Yeah. Oh my God. I missed that in the film. I didn't understand the, the French yeah. labeling part. Yeah. That's why it happened. Wow. Um, that's, that's outlandish. That's bad. Um, did you cross any lines in the sand? Like, did you have any things that you were like, I'm not doing this. Uh, I'm not going to eat that or. Um, well, I guess when we were gathering food, because we would sometimes purchase food at a grocery store, um, if we thought that if they'd already culled it or they put it on the discount rack, um, but we also did take food from dumpsters. So our, our base rule was that we never cut any locks. We never jumped any fences. Like the dumpster had to be open mm -hmm. so that you could just walk up and like look inside. Um, that was like my base level. Um, I did serve some of the food that we found at like a work event, <laughs> but, but I didn't do it too often. And we did share with friends, but we always told them what we were doing. Um, and mostly I, almost everything we ate, we started to get pickier as we went along. So at first we'd be like, yeah, food. And we'd just like take it home. And then you'd open the box to be like, oh, it's actually like too close to the date. And it's like pretty stale and disgusting. Like, I don't think it would hurt you, but I don't want to eat stale crackers. So we gradually got smarter and would actually like taste one while we were there to make sure that we liked the product. Um, cause just cause it's available and you can save it doesn't mean you need mm -hmm. to take it or eat it. We ate way more processed food than we normally would just because like it was there and it was like energy balls. Like why not take mm -hmm. them home? So yeah, normally and I at one, have that at one point place. you guys came across like a bunch of uh, chicken and bacon and things from an event, mm -hmm. um, like some corporate event. Mm -hmm. um, or no, it was a, it was a um, photo Pizza. shoot. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so, and I heard you say like, I don't eat bacon. Yeah. I don't yeah. want that. But then, you know, for the project, you're, you're like, okay, I have all this bacon now. Yeah. So we did eat bacon then. And that was what the one time I think that we really got meat. Um, we found lots of meat, but usually it'd be like hams and they'd be like slashed open. Like, I'm not going to eat that. Obviously it's not going to be safe. Um, but that particular call, um, our friend had told us they're going to throw it out right now. We just had mm -hmm. it on this commercial shoot. You know, they're picking out the best pieces of chicken to put on the thing for the ad. Um, and I can't believe they didn't take it home. If I was working on that commercial shoot, I would have just taken it home. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we got there right away and it was like still cold. So I felt like it was pretty safe and it lasted us for a really long time. That is the thing with this project. Like as I was doing it, I got less and less embarrassed about the topic of food waste. I think because I was more enraged. So now I think nothing of going to an event and be like, so what are you doing with your leftovers at this event? Like, if you don't have a plan, I can help hook you up with an organization or like I have a container right here. You can put some leftovers in it. Um, I feel like I have no shame about that anymore. Um, I have a question in the chat. Let's see. Um... How long did Jenny and Grant go without purchasing food and only using food that would be thrown away when making the film? It was six months. It was a full six months. So originally I agreed to one month and then we did three months and then six months. And then I was like, this is it, I'm done. It's a long time. Yeah, yeah. It's a long time. And it's like, it took, it took a lot of your time. It was like time consuming, it looked like it. Time consuming to kind of think it through, plan it, find it, save it, store it. Um, you know, cause sometimes you would end up with so much of one particular kind of product yeah. and then kind of the, um, just, yeah, the energy and time six months is a long time. To yeah, so, I mean, it was, yeah, it was a lifestyle, but it was a project. It was for a, a greater purpose. Like mm -hmm. the point of us dumpster diving was not to be like, everybody go dumpster dive. Like that actually doesn't solve 
the problem at all. Um, it was just a way to illustrate the quality of the food. Um, I think if I did it again, I would actually involve more people in it, like have more community dinners um, and things like that, which we got to do after we released the film. We got to tour all over the place and we would often have like a movie and a rescued food dinner that went hand in hand. And that was such a fun way to kind of share our message and to really like taste the fact that the food was still good. So, I mean, I don't know if I would recommend it as a regular lifestyle, but you know, here and there, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. Um, Kelvin is asking, any thoughts on restaurants in New York that are dumping good food daily and yet there are many people going hungry? Um, yeah, I mean, there's restaurants waste some food. I feel like restaurants are actually pretty efficient because their bottom line is that they want to make money and they try to do the best they can. And I think especially like higher end restaurants you know like they're making stock out of their food scraps for the next day kind of thing like good chefs know how to do that I think if you go into the type of restaurant that has like 50 things on the menu sure there's probably some more food waste coming from those ones that said there are uh, lots of organizations that are willing to pick up surplus that are willing to redistribute it and I've seen some apps recently where you know just regular people can go on and at the end of the night the restaurant can say, hey, I've got like this, this, and this, and it's like five bucks, come pick it up. And you can just pay for it on the app and go pick it up. And if they're willing to do that little bit of extra labor, I think it does make a big difference. Um, can you give us an example of when you convince somebody to care about food waste? Well, or, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, surplus food. Right. Um, well, I try never to convince people because I feel like that's not my role. So as filmmakers, we try to show people a story and they can make up their own mind about it. And sometimes people need to get a message like multiple times, but I mean, I'm not trying to convert everybody into dumpster diving. Um, however, I have lots of great anecdotes. I know a teacher who, unfortunately, because we need more teachers, but he quit his job and he started a food rescue agency that picks up surplus food and gets it to people who need it. And it was specifically because of the film. And I know a couple of people, a couple of students who changed their major um, to different policy options because they were inspired about food rescue and wanted to get like more involved in it. So that, that was pretty cool. I mean, that was not the point of our film, but it, it's really neat to hear stories like that. Wow, yeah, that's great. Um, do you know if Quest, that, that, um, that store in the film that takes, uh, like imperfect food from grocery stores and they sell it to people in need specifically mm -hmm. are those things do we have those in the states or mm -hmm. was that in that was in canada that was right? in canada and they they do have four locations around here maybe five now um i don't know that specific model just because so they have these grocery stores that are fully stocked with um, surplus food and they sell it super super cheap like you still have to spend your own money and you get to choose what you want so that's part of their offering but it would be like soup is 10 cents kind of thing and like bread is 50 cents um, so it is really economical and they also have a great volunteer program where you can volunteer a shift and then you get a credit at the store that you can spend um, so I, I met lots of really interesting people there as well um, I haven't heard of that exact model in the States, but I do know that in Boston, I think there is a grocery store that similar thing, it, it is open to the public, but it is selling kind of surplus food and they specifically put it in a zip code where they knew that there's more lower income people so that they could take advantage of that. Um, and I think that is from the company that does Trader Joe's, like it's from the CEO of Trader Joe's. Oh, Good to know. Okay. And of course, there's food banks and all kinds of food rescue organizations mm -hmm. in every single city. Mm -hmm. I, I, like 10 years ago, I volunteered for City Harvest mm -hmm. um, in New York. They're like, I think they're one of the largest food rescue organizations in the country. Um, what parts of the project have you continued? Like, obviously, you're not doing that insane, you know, six month long time consuming project, but you know, are you still volunteering at Quest or are you? I'm, I wish I was volunteering at Quest. I'm not right now. I have two kids and I <laughs> traded them. We can't do everything. We can't I do know. it all. Um, we're still really big composters. Since 
since the project, our municipality has brought in like curbside composting, which makes it even easier because you don't have to do it in your backyard. You can just like drop it off on the curb and they take meat and dairy and things like that. Um, and I'm back to gardening a lot, which is what I did before the project, which I think really reduces, like the more local you can make your food, the less waste you have. You know, when you just need a little bit of herbs and you go to your garden and snip it or snip it out of your window box, rather than um, buy a big bunch at the store and then three quarters of it ends up in the waste. Um, that always works better. So I always try to have a curb going, garden going. Um, I'm definitely, getting better at meal planning and I always eat leftovers. I have no problem with leftovers. I have no problem with batch cooking and then freezing part of it. And in our house, my kids know we eat family style. So we put the dishes on the table and you can serve your own plate. Like even the four-year-old can serve her own plate. And if you put it on your plate, you eat it, um, but you don't have to take anything. We're not pushy around food because I want people to enjoy it and love it and not waste it. So if it's on their plate, they have to clean it. But other than that, they can leave it in the family style portions and we can eat it another day. Cool. And is that, <clears throat> has that changed since the film? Because the film is actually from 2014, right? So it's, yeah. it's seven or eight years old at this point. Yeah, I know. It's, crazy. <laughs> it's still um, a problem. It's still important. It is totally still a problem. Yeah, we didn't solve the problem with the film. Um, I have seen way more mainstream awareness of food waste. Like the, I think in 2015, 16, it was like on the cover of National Geographic. It was like, they were talking about ugly produce on the Tyra Banks show. It was on the John Oliver show. Like it was in mainstream media talking about food waste, which was cool. I think if you ask the average person on the street, like they wouldn't have even understood anything about it. And now maybe they would get a little bit more. Um, and I've seen lots of really cool programs coming out, like grocery stores that are marketing ugly fruits and vegetables, which are just like misshapen mm -hmm. um, and selling them at a little bit of a discount. Um, I always look for those kinds of marketing things. And I think that they're really fun. Like they always rely on humor a little bit. So why not jump on board? I've seen tons of nonprofits starting new things. Like we did a, we did a rescued um, bread beer with a local beer brewery here. So we, we, teamed up with a bakery that had surplus bread, brought it to the brewery. They used it instead of grain in their beer and made a new beer. And then we put the proceeds into like another nonprofit. Like there's lots of little things that have been happening that are really, really inspiring. Wow. And what do you think is next on your horizon? Um, so we kind of had to decide after we did Just Eat It, we'd done two films that were really about sustainability and and recycling and I was like ready to go like I was like should we start our own food rescue organization like maybe we need to be more activists and really go down this road or do we take this other road and and allow other people to share their stories and become filmmakers that can facilitate that and so we did kind of take that second road I do try to stay really involved connecting people and volunteering where I can we've had lots of interesting food rescue dinners to benefit different organizations um, but we ended up quitting our jobs and becoming full-time filmmakers. So we made a couple other films about other people and sharing their stories, which is really fun as well. That's great. Well, um, let me just see if there's any other questions. It looks like, um, Ksenia said there's some grocery stores in Oregon who donate to, um, shelters and food pantries and more stores should do that, which is true um okay thank you so much a, jenny i have a comment about the uh about grocery stores because i i've asked many many grocery stores like i always go in and i'm like so what do you guys do with your surplus food and i think for a lot of them it's it's the consistency like if if someone's going to pick up food from them on wednesday nights it, they need to be there it has to be every wednesday night and sometimes it's hard if, with these volunteer organizations to make it really happen but it is really important those relationships because if they get everything already and no one picks it up like they're going to give up on that system and so it is about you know logistics and, and consistency very good point um thank you so much i'm going to turn us back over to stacy mm -hmm. um it was so great to meet you virtually thank you so much for this um the film is fantastic i encourage everybody i watched it on hulu actually oh, great. so maybe maybe it's on like all of the platforms but um 
I really enjoyed it. It's super well made and so informative um, and fun. Um, so please watch it. And if not, we're going to be watching it together May 12th at Inform Your Community. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear all those wonderful stories. I do have one other question and then we'll open it up for just any last remaining questions from the audience. Um, I was curious, I want you to take us behind the scenes and, and can you tell me uh, what was the funniest thing that happened while you were filming? Hmm. I mean, in retrospect, it was funny, but it wasn't funny at the time. It's like Grant, Grant got super into the dumpster diving. Like he would like get in the dumpster and like be rooting around and stuff. And one time somebody actually did throw some garbage on him. Um, <laughs> he was a little bit embarrassed about it, but I thought it was hilarious. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of the things that happened, we did try to put in the film. It was a very indie. So like if Grant's on the screen, when you, if you haven't watched it, when Grant's on the screen, I film it and when I'm on the screen he films it there's a very few times where we would set up a tripod and we would like both be dumpster diving at the same time um but generally speaking like we did everything in the film like we we filmed it he edited it he even did the music for the film um and we like made it in our basement so we were over the moon when it did so well at festivals and ended up you know being on mainstream television and and all of the regular streaming platforms like it's pretty exciting my famous, I mean, I mean it, congratulations on all that success. It, it is an outstanding film. My, one of my, I don't know if it's favorite scenes or most shocking scenes, but watching Grant um, and you categorize and log everything that you took in. Um, and I would, I mean, I don't know if you have those statistics somewhere, but I, I, I can just imagine what, you know, how much stuff you took in. But for those who didn't see the film, they're, they logged, did you log everything or did you give up on that at some point? I think I did get up, give up partway through, but. <laughs> yeah, because at some point you were logging it and you could tell that it was just the process of logging all of the food you were getting was just overwhelming in of itself, like time consuming. And then I think you kind of panned to your cabinets and it was just, I mean, I don't want to give anything away in the film, but just cabinets of unopened, perfectly you know perfect condition boxes of food it, just cabinets and cabinets of it which was which was just astounding and it was particularly funny because uh i was i was at the um i was watching it and i invited my my husband to watch it with me and he's like no i i can't i and really disgust on his face i i can't i i can't it'll just gross me out i can't watch a food on, on food a film on food waste i can't do it and and periodically he'd come in and I'm like, Mike, it's not, it, you know, it's not bad. Come watch it. No, I, mm, 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 mm. And, and then when I saw all these perfect containers of food, I'm, and I kept waiting for the like really disgusting part. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to see absolutely disgusting, like dumpster diving, disgust, and it, it, it didn't come. It, it really didn't come. It really is just surplus. I mean, we, we were behind a bakery once um, getting bread that was literally a day old. Like there was nothing wrong with it anyway. And the baker actually came out. He's like, what are you guys doing? And we're like, oh, sorry, we're just rescuing this bread. And he's like, oh, wait a second. And he like went back inside and he brought us some like legitimately truly fresh bread, like warm oh. bread. And he's like, this is probably going to be surplus as well. So you can take it. <laughs> did, did you find that people were re receptive to you doing it? I mean, I, you know, not having done that. I would imagine that, you know, even even though you are rescuing the food, that the people who are working there are saying, get out of my garbage can. What are you doing on my property? I mean, that's why we did it at night, I guess. Um, <laughs> but generally, no. I yeah. mean, you know, the security guards didn't really care. They were there to protect the fleet vehicles. They wanted to make sure we weren't stealing tires off the trucks or whatever. Like, they didn't really care about things that had already been thrown out. And the people who worked at the grocery store, they were like, sure, like, you want to buy this thing that I already took off the shelf, like whatever you want to do, lady. Like, <laughs> they didn't really mind either. And then when we talk to people in charge, like they don't really want to waste food. It's either they're confused about the regulations, um, like they're scared people are going to sue them if they get sick, which is, you know, everybody's covered. The United States has blanket legislation to protect people who donate food and you can't get sued. 
Um, so they're either malinformed or they just, I don't know, don't have the time to organize the pickups and the extra labor that it takes. Sure. That may, that, unfortunately, that makes a lot of sense. We do have another question. Of course, uh, we're, we're in our last minutes here. So anybody else with any questions? I know this is very thorough, uh, what we heard. So, uh, but, so Kelvin asked, um, thanks for sharing. Uh, uh, and uh, he was invited to the event. So um, what platforms can one go to uh, in order to watch it? And we, we covered that a little bit. It sounds like Hulu, but you may know more. We know Hulu, um, Amazon Prime, and Netflix. Um, I don't know. If, I don't think I believe the Netflix thing. I think it's on Amazon Prime. Oh. It might be. I think it's on iTunes. Oh. Um, Hulu. I'm not sure because I don't know. Our distributor does that part for us. But if you search it, I'm sure you can find it. Even your library <laughs> might have a copy. Excellent. Excellent point. And uh, and it, it, it seems to be on YouTube too, although I don't know if that's an official copy or if that's somebody who's- uh, No, I think there is a legit copy okay. through our distributor on YouTube. They make okay. the ads or something. Okay, perfect, perfect. Don't feel bad if you watch it on YouTube. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, so that's great. So YouTube, so Megan, thank you for, uh, for suggesting that. And um, uh, excellent. Uh, and Kelvin said, said thank you for that. Any other questions or anything do, that you want to share with us that we haven't covered? Um, oh, at the beginning, when you mentioned Weirwell well Yankovic, they were so funny because when we were making the film the whole time, we're like, we're going to use that music in our credits. Like, it's going to be great. And in the end, like the song was just too silly. It just didn't work with our credits. And then we blew our entire music budget on that um, Simple Minds song, Don't You Forget About Me. Um, watch for it in the film. It was super expensive to license that song. <laughs> but please enjoy it. <laughs> and it was a, it's actually funny. It did occur to, uh, uh, to, to me as we were preparing for this event, like, oh, it, you know, while we're like waiting at the beginning, maybe I can play the just eat it, you know, in the background. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be kind of fun, right? I mean, we do fun events. And then I thought, like, I, I don't know how the licensing on that works. <laughs> like, <laughs> Technically, we probably should pay for that, right? We shouldn't just have that in the background, like while we're doing our event. So, you know, uh, maybe uh, next time when we have an event like this, uh, if we have you come out again, we'll 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 look into the licensing of that, and maybe we'll do it. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's expensive, also. So, uh, but I did. I was curious. Uh, was that your plan the whole time? You knew you wanted to call it just just eat it. Yeah, we like we decided partway through we had like a brainstorm with our friends and it was just, you know, it's easy to remember. It's, it's a fun message. And that's really what we're all about. I mean, I, I'm really passionate about these issues. I think they're really important. But I also think like, there's already a lot of doom and gloom type documentaries. And that's not the kind of film that we want to make. So we want to make something that's fun and accessible. And you know, a six year old can watch it and get something out of it as well. So um, yeah. I definitely think you achieved that, and and I, I I like in your promo material that you call it deliciously entertaining, and I and I I think it absolutely was, and and uh, I'm sure everybody who's on here, if they haven't watched it yet, they're going to go out and watch it very soon. Uh, thank you, Jenny, so much for for joining us for this discussion um, a, a, about this topic, and uh, I'm also going to go watch those outtakes uh, that you uh, the, you mentioned might be on the website. I'm going to go check that out there. Um, and because of the topic of that, the topic of food waste um, is an ongoing conversation. This is not one of those topics that it's like one and done. You've heard all you need to know about this topic and you never do anything about it again. This is not that kind of a topic. This is one we really want you to, you know, delve into, um, you know, try incorporating these things into your own lifestyle, watch the movie, uh, do your research. Um, like, frankly, all the topics we discuss at Inform Your Community. So we're going to be sending you after this event, uh, probably tomorrow, actually, we'll be sending you um, an email with some additional information, including our infographic that will contain some, uh, some kind of fun facts uh, about the topic that we talked about today. And we encourage you um, to share that infographic widely, let them know about this event and what we do here at Inform Your Community. Uh, additionally, we want you to consider committing to one additional food waste. In addition to sharing that infographic, we want you to commit to one additional food waste uh, avoidance um, uh, or food rescue um, action. You know, try to do something else, maybe, you know, even once a month, once a week, try to do something um, that will help with that food rescue 
uh, topic that we talked about today. And we have our event on May 12th. The email that we already sent out uh, that we're going to be sending out is also going to have a survey on it. Tell us what you thought of this event. Uh, come back for our event on May 12th. Uh, and of course, you can find the film, like we said, on those platforms that we discussed, Hulu and uh, Netflix, maybe. I don't know where I got that from, but I thought I saw that. Um, but uh, Amazon Prime uh, and, and also uh, on YouTube. So um, look out for more great topics from Inform Your Community, not only for in our Know It All series, which is the series we have right now, but also in um, the other programs we offer. We have children's crafting and adult crafting, um, as well as um, our movie night, like we're going to have on May 12th. We have a networking event and also shopping events. So we have lots of different programs. So check us out on our website. And I just want to thank everybody uh, for coming to our event. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. There's an opportunity in that email you're going to get, like I said, to fill out that survey. So let us know what you think. We love, um, we love also getting quotes that we can use on our website to, to, to you know, help us promote our activities. So thank you so much, Jenny, again, for coming. Uh, really appreciate it. It's an honor. And thank you, everybody who uh, attended. Really great to, to have everybody here. Take care. <laughs>